Welcome to New Life Living, brought to you by New Life Church in Rio Rancho, New Mexico. We hope this Bible study led by Pastor Alan Brooks encourages you in living the new life Jesus is offering you. So, um, as you can tell, we're continuing our uh, team teaching, and that's through the entire Advent season this year, all the way up to a special guest on Christmas Eve. You know, I was thinking this past week that sometimes people wonder why we celebrate Advent. And rather than just as some churches do, they just have a Christmas Eve service. We are having Christmas Eve services at 3 and 5, if you don't know. But if you think about this event and how big it is, it's too big just for one night, right? And that's why for myself, and I hope you feel the same way, I really want this season, these few weeks, to get ready and get my mind and my heart right about it. But today I want you guys to help me uh, welcome Tony Areno. Welcome today, Tony. Hi. Tony is uh, one of our ministry leaders, heads up Life Group 9, if I have the number right. You do. So, uh, Tony, tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, well, I have been married to my wife, Allison, who's down here for coming up on 12 years. Yeah. Um, yeah, Christmas Eve will actually be 12 years engaged. Oh, wow. Right? Um, I got my numbers right. <laughs> we've, got, uh, we've got two kiddos. I studied that before I got here. But we've got two kiddos, uh, four and two, Samuel and Leah. And we are fairly new to the uh, New Mexico area. We moved here in March, the end of March, and uh, have been part of the New Life family since uh, the first week of May. That's awesome. And uh, professionally, you're a claims adjuster, right? Yeah, so not as cool as Joe last week. Um, not a nuclear engineer? No, okay. not at all. I don't even know what that means. Um, <laughs> No, I supervise a team of seven folks here in New Mexico that uh, handle injury claims. There you go. So any complaints you have, Joe, or, I mean, uh, Tony will be handing those right up front after the service. Right here. <laughs> I will deny you. I'm just kidding. Well, as all of you can tell and as uh, we know, we are talking about this word joy today. But as we talk about joy, I mean, what comes to your mind, Tony, when you think of the word joy? Oh, man, you just think about this. Um, light is kind of the the thing that comes to mind is just there's this constant light there's not a there's not really a, a darkness that overpowers but just light that's what i think of when i think of joy interesting and it was interesting those presents lit up as the as that joy was talking about it's the first time i've seen that video and yeah, absolutely. It was interesting that, that happened that way you know I, I did a little word search as i like to from time to time and there's a whole family of words and this is out of the new oxford american dictionary but it defines happy as a feeling or showing of pleasure or contentment, glad as pleased or delighted, but it defined joy as a feeling of great pleasure and happiness. And if you think about it, it's, it's kind of like happy and glad wrapped up in one big package, right, is this idea of joy. Um, we've been in a series for the last couple of weeks looking at this question, what if Jesus had never been born. There are certainly uh, the critics of the church and of Christianity in general that are in our world today, and uh, some claims have been made, you've heard some of them I'm sure, that the world would be better off if there weren't any Christians, if there had never been a Jesus. So we've kind of been analyzing that question, is that true? And even to this particular area, the question we're asking you to consider is if Jesus had never been born, what would be your joy. Now, to be honest, to be real here, I mean, people do find joy, you know, even apart from Jesus, right? Yeah, absolutely. So what are some examples that you can think of that? You know, I think about the first time we bought our first house in Canyon City, Colorado. You know, just the, when you walk through the door the first time and it's yours, you yeah, know. Yeah, a new home. Yeah, here's the keys, this is mine, that's my grass and dirt. Um, which is what it was. And it stayed dirt for a long it time. It stayed dirt for a very long time. Um, but yeah, I remember that being this thought or this feeling of just happiness and gladness. Yeah, so I mean, it can come in a lot of different forms. It can come in the joy of a new home, it can come in the, the joy of a new child, uh, a new relationship in marriage. I, I, I heard a, a cute story this week about a, a, 
a reasonably newly married couple. They had been married a few years, and they got lost uh, right before Christmas, you know, in the shopping mall. It was so crowded, and they were looking at different things, and so they got separated between each other. And so the wife, a little bit frustrated because she's got all these things that need to get done and they need to get out of there. So she calls her husband on the cell and says, where are you? You know, we've got all this shopping we've got to do. And he says, honey, do you, do you remember that jewelry that we found before we were married? And they had that diamond necklace that you fell in love with. And I told you that one day we were going to buy it for you. And so the frustration she was fe feeling really quickly turned to these tears of joy. And as she realized, wow, she had been frustrated with her husband. And then he went on to say, I'm in the gun store right next door. Uh, <laughs> yep. How quickly it changes, right? And the truth of the matter is, human joy, these earthly joys that we discover, are often short and fleeting. You know, even the joy of that new child very quickly turns into sleepless nights or the terrible twos later on, or the rebellious teenage years, all those sorts of things. It's not that there's not still moments of joy in those relationships or even in those things, but even in stuff, you know, that joy comes and it goes. And the thing we're looking at here today is because of Jesus, because he was born, is that we can have this sense of a joy that isn't passing, mm -hmm. It isn't up and down, in and out. It isn't fleeting. It's permanent. It's everlasting. But wow. is that your joy today? Again, I, th I think you're finding joys even in this season from buying gifts and getting together with loved ones and friends and that sort of thing. We had a Christmas party here, a number of us, last night in leadership. And those are always fun and joyous. But is that the source of your joy, or is this other joy that I'm talking about, this real joy, is that what you're looking to this season? If you haven't already done so, I'd ask you to turn to our passage for today. We're reading out of the English Standard. It's 1 Peter chapter 1. We're going to actually start in verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy... He has raised us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Wow. And so we see as, as Peter starts out this letter, he starts it with a praise to God. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we know that, you know, this time in history that, you know, it was not easy to be a believer. There was a lot of things that you necessarily might not find joy in. You know, there were trials, there were, there were things going on. Pastor Allen mentioned last week that, you know, believers were sometimes burned alive. I mean, this is not a, a great time from a human standpoint to be a believer. And yet Peter starts this, this letter with a praise to God. And it's easy for us, and me especially, I know that when life is going good, when health is fine and new things happen, babies or homes, those kind of things are, are purchased, easy to find joy and praise God. Easy to, oh, thank you, Jesus. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ for this new thing. Um, but that's not the case with these believers here. And yet... Peter points out some things that, you know, you can praise God for and that these believers can praise God for. And first, his abundant or great mercy. You know, we all know that mercy is not getting what we deserve. You know, and there are things that we deserve because of sin in our lives, and Peter understands and these believers understand that they're not getting that. And so he can praise God for that, you know, for new life, for a living hope. And it was interesting, you and Jay had talked about hope a few weeks ago, and then our life group had chatted a little bit about this because we wanted to understand, do we really know what this word hope means? You know, it's not this wishfulness that we have, you know, like, hope so. I hope it doesn't snow today, right. or I hope the Broncos win, which I do. <laughs> just saying, right? <laughs> but yeah, just, just throwing that out there. I know you guys hope the same thing. Um, I just lost credibility with about half the room probably there. But uh, this hope is a confidence because of, as he puts it here, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. 
You know, we can have that confident hope. And then Peter goes on, and it's very interesting, I think, this illustration that he uses about an inheritance. For most of us, we can probably, re- you know, relate to that in some way. You know, maybe we know somebody who has received an inheritance. You know, maybe you've received an inheritance yourself. And the circumstances by which you receive an inheritance don't always bring gladness or joy. Because it's usually because, you know, somebody you love has passed away. Um, you know, and, and I know personally two people in, in my life very close to me that have received an inheritance. And, and I did see that once this inheritance is received, there is this happiness or joy. Because in, in one of these circumstances, there were some medical bill things that had to be taken care of. I saw the purchase of a new car, a brand new car, you know, that year paid for. Uh, I saw generosity like I had never seen from this person before. You'd go out to dinner, and they're picking up the whole tab, and they're inviting you to do stuff. And, but in both cases, that inheritance faded away. It's gone. I don't know if you've known anybody that's received an inheritance. or. Yeah, I, my, my sister actually, through her husband's side of the family, inherited um, over a million dollars. And um, it radically changed their life because they had gone from fairly normal means to having an abundance and a lot. Um, they very quickly, as it sounded like in your examples, spent all of that money and uh, aren't even married today. Oh, wow. Uh, you know, because they went up and, and they crashed even faster. You know, and it's interesting that Peter uses this illustration with this group of believers. Because, you know, you, you may or may not know that this letter is written to those that have been kind of scattered abroad. Those that have probably been forced from their homes. Those that have probably had everything taken from them. You know, we have... Uh, you know, if they had an inheritance or they had an inheritance they were planning to leave to their children, likely it was gone. Yeah, earthly, earthly. An earthly inheritance. And, and Peter here talks about this inheritance that's not like the ones we just talked about. You know, if you look at the, the details or the description of this inheritance, it is imperishable, uh, incorruptible, another word there, uh, meaning it can't be destroyed. There's nothing that can be done that would destroy this inheritance. It's undefiled, it's perfect. It's not tarnished by anything, and it's unfading. You know, what I love about it is that it's kept by God oh. in safekeeping in heaven, okay, where, where we can't get at it and go spend it or whatever. And that probably the most important piece of this whole deal. Yeah. That, I can't think of a better safe deposit box for <laughs> your inheritance than to be kept by God in heaven. Um, and Peter goes on talking about the believers uh, in verse 5 saying, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. And I don't know that I fully understand or grasp the magnitude of that statement. You know, as I think about the God of the universe, the one who spoke this world into existence, the God who, and we have many stories, you know, who parted the sea and dried the land immediately so people can walk, stopped the sun in the sky. I mean, this same God guards or keeps me. And I don't know what you think about when, when, when that is, is brought to you or brought to your attention. When I, when I looked at the passage this week, I actually looked at it out of the message translation. And uh, it, it says, the day is coming. Listen to this. When you'll have it all. Life healed and whole. Wow. wow. That's, that's the kind of inheritance that we can really get excited about, that we can be joyous you know, and I, I read about a guy who had less specific instructions when he passed away that he wanted one word left on his tombstone, kept. And that same word guarded here is the same word kept. Huh. And I wonder what kind of joy he had in this life in Christ, understanding and knowing that he is guarded by the God of the universe. And, you know, the, the interesting thing about the second half of this verse, it says that we are kept for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. You know, when I think about this Christmas season, you know, as a parent, some of you guys may be in the same, same boat as I am, you know, we try not to, you know, boost up the, uh, the commercialism or the gift giving of Christmas time, but as a parent, I've got a couple of things for my kiddos that I can't wait to give them. I mean, I know that there's going to be an excitement and even a, a temporary joy, probably more for the box than what's in the box, <laughs> but in there. okay. there's... there's I have this excitement to reveal these gifts to my kiddos, and I can't help but think, and this probably pales in comparison, but of the excitement that God must have ready to reveal this salvation 
he has for us in this last time. And so as we, yeah, it's, it's, I mean, you think about the joy that that brings this group of people. You know, they've had potentially an inheritance that's been taken away, right. and now they know about one that never will be. As we move on in First uh, Peter, pick up with me in verse 6. It says, In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. I don't know what comes to your mind when you read those verses, but uh, this week as I was studying it, it reminded me of another very popular passage. You might know which one I'm thinking of. Yeah, James, James. chapter 1. You know, it sounds very similar, you know, what Peter says here. But don't miss what he says that we should be rejoicing in, because that's the biggie here. It's what's been just talked about. It is this inheritance that God has for us. It's that very thing which we should be rejoicing exceedingly, I would say. But he goes on to say something that I think we all understand. Though now, for a little while, that we've got to be grieved by these various trials. Think with me just for a second. Let's go back a year ago. What trial were you facing? Now, for most of you, most of us, we can't even remember what trial it was a year ago, right? Some we can because it was so significant of a change in our life. But that's the way a lot of the trials are, right? We go through them and it's all we can seemingly think about, but they pass. And that's part of what I think Peter is saying here, too, is that isn't it a single kind of trial? There's a various degree of trials. I mean, there's relational trials, a break in a relationship between friends, between family members, between um, whoever, siblings, parents, children, whatever the case might be. But other people have financial trials. So there's a wide range of different trials, and the trial we have now may not even necessarily be the trial that we'll have a year from now. There may be a whole new one. These trials, as we said last week, it's so important that we catch this, are very often allowed by God so that we can grow, so that we can get better. But Peter wants to remind us, and even those who've been dispersed, as all these people had lost everything they had and were spread out through the land, he wants to remind them that even the trials they're going to continue to face, they're not going to go on forever, that eventually it's going to come to an end. One of the things that I love about this word trials is it can also be translated tests. And depending on your translation this morning, you might actually have it that way. That we are going to be grieved by various tests. Now, test, I think, puts a little different spin on this, doesn't it? It does. Because when we think of a test, what do we think? Something I have to pass. Think of school, something you have to pass. Uh, But you think of grades, right? You know, that there's an assessment that's being done. And part of what Peter is telling us is there's an assessment being done of our faith. Is our faith real or is it imitation? Oh, wow. Now, I think we've all seen examples of that, but does anything come to mind to you, you know, for you, something that was a clear test in somebody's life that either brought real evidence of their faith or evidence that there really wasn't any? Well, and, uh, you know, this, is a, this was a real test in my life and a trial that, that I had gone through, but it really helped me understand this and true joy is it's been probably five, six years ago now that my father had passed away pretty tragically. And uh, we had just been on vacation, a beautiful, wonderful time, had come home literally. I had 13, 14 missed calls from the airline flight in the airport, and we find out in the airport on the way home that my dad had just passed away. And so we're on a plane the next day to go out. And I remember the, uh, the person that was coming to give the service for my dad uh, almost wasn't going to be able to make it. Uh, it was a hurricane in New Jersey at the time, and that's where we were. And I remember God just impressing upon me, you can do that. I'm like, wait a minute, Lord, that's, my, my dad just passed away, and, and do that, do I can service. do the service. Yeah, right. 
And, and I remember this peace and even joy that I had that God would allow me to stand up to honor my father, even though he had just passed away. And, and I remember that being a, a real test because many of my family there are not believers in Christ. And so I got to share with them a little bit about, well, how can you, how can you even stand up and do that? Well, let me tell you why. And so that's, that was, that was a, a pretty big example in my life. Peter compares our faith to this thing we talked a little bit about last week as well, and that's gold. In the message again, verse 7 is translated this way. It says, pure gold put in the fire comes out of it proved pure. Genuine faith put through this suffering comes out proved genuine. The reality of gold is imitation gold. You know, that stuff you buy at the discount stores or whatever. You know, if it's fired, it's just going to be burned up and be destroyed. You won't have that pure gold that gets stronger and is better because of the fire. But notice this, and I think this is the biggie for us. Genuine faith is more precious hmm. than genuine gold. You know, a lot of us put a lot of stock into, you know, things like gold and silver, that sort of thing. But here, Peter's trying to tell them because they don't have any gold or silver anymore. <laughs> you know, he's saying, hey, no, your faith, that genuine faith is more precious to God than gold. Now, he makes a very profound statement in verse 7. He says that it may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. There's an interesting question here. Whose praise, glory, and honor is Peter talking about? What do you think? I can tell you that the scholars are divided. Some scholars think it's the praise, glory, and honor that Jesus will receive when he returns. There are other scholars, however, say that there's praise, glory, and honor that will be given to those who had genuine faith at the time that Jesus returns. I suspect it's a little bit of both. I was going to say. That there's this great opportunity for praise, glory, and honor when the kingdom of God comes. We'll honor our Jesus, but our Jesus will honor us for standing firm in our faith in him. Cool stuff, isn't oh, it? Oh, wow. Let's go back to our passage here in verse 8. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. You know, what's interesting is as you read that, that reminds me of the encounter with Jesus and Thomas, the first time that Thomas sees Christ after he rose from the dead. You know, if you remember the story, uh, you know, many of the disciples had seen Christ and they're sharing this account with Thomas. Hey, we, we've, we've seen Christ and Thomas is like, hey, let, yeah, I don't think <laughs> I'll believe it when I see it. Like, you know, don't. And we all know that he gets his name, Doubting Thomas, from, from things like this. But, um, you know, not barely more than a week later, this group is back together. The disciples are together behind a locked door. And Christ comes through the locked door, and Thomas sees Jesus raised from the dead for the first time. And if you will, just read with me uh, in John uh, chapter 20, verses 27 through 29. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands, and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. And I can't imagine the joy that Thomas must have had, you know, Jesus, whom he loved, whom he spent the last several years with, who died and is now here. Just, I mean, imagine his, his joy. Imagine the joy you will have when you see Christ for the first time. And he exclaims, my Lord and my God. And Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen me and yet have believed. Yeah, and you know, I've, I've always seen that verse as speaking about us, because that's where we're at, right? We, we have this faith that Peter is talking about here, that though we haven't seen him, yet we still believe in him. 
I was thinking this week, I'd share this with a couple of friends, that we were talking last week about the kingdom of heaven and the millennium, that when Christ is back on the earth, it's going to be back again like it was when Jesus was here for the first time. And so people are still going to be faced with the dilemma, not unlike the Pharisees and all the other people, having to decide whether they were going to believe that he indeed was the Son of God. And hmm. they're going to be back into that same zone. But we're in that place right now where Thomas was in between seeing him resurrect and like, can I really believe that or not? And it's pr that's a pretty cool place for us to be. And that's why our faith is so precious to God, because we believe without seeing. You know, and, and as, as Peter goes on, you know, he says something very similar, but I think it's of note that he says something else when you look at this. It says, though you have not seen him, you love him. Yeah. You know, though you do not now see him, you believe. So he does say that as well, but he uses that word, you love him. And we know that Peter loved Christ. I mean, you know, Peter was the one who would stand up you know, when, when questions came up about Christ. And Peter was that guy who, when Jesus asked him, you know, you could tell that there's this love that Peter has for Jesus. But we got to remember that Peter also knows that he was the guy, when it got tough, when Christ was taken to be crucified, that denied Christ. Three times. Three times he denied Christ. You know, and, and we see here that he sees a group of people who have not seen Christ face to face that love him, that have not denied him, that have a joy that is inexpressible yeah. and great filled with glory. It's a for those of you that know the end of the Gospel of John, because oh, yeah. as uh, Peter and some of the disciples are there on the, on the beach, you know, they, uh, or excuse me, I guess Jesus is on the beach, and yeah. they're out fishing, and so he calls them in, and um, Jesus asked Peter again three times this simple question. Do you, Do love, you love me? me? You know, to reaffirm the relationship they have with each other. And every time, Peter says yes. And it is interesting that it's three times yeah. that he asks him that question, yeah. knowing that Peter had denied three times. But we see this, and I can't help but think about the respect that Peter must have for this group of believers. You know, the, the love that he even must have for them, because they love the Jesus that he loves, and they have never seen him. You know, and, and this... The way he words this is, is incredible to me, that he says, and you rejoice with a joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory. And I read something this week as I was studying this by, uh, by pastor and author of the Through the Bible series, J. Vernon McGee, and I thought about trying to say this like J. Vernon McGee, and I practiced <laughs> this in front of my mirror, and it did not work out well, so I will just say it, uh, with, I will spare you. Uh, what that might sound like, but it talk, in talking about this passage, he says, ye rejoice with a joy unspeakable and full of glory. Loving Christ brings rejoicing to your heart. Are you a rejoicing Christian, my friend? You should be. You are a child of the King, and you have an inheritance coming to you someday. How wonderful it is to be his child. It was there we go. Amen. I was, Amen. I, I was hoping they'd get that. That's big stuff. There we go. You know, and I asked that same question. Are you a rejoicing Christian, my friend? You know, we just, we just talked about how your, your faith is tested by trials. And, and I think about as, as people watch us as believers in Jesus Christ, they watch to see how we react in trial. They watch to see how we react when we're tested. They, know, they don't know it's a test. They just see it as a trial in your life, as something bad going on. But can we show them a rejoicing with a joy that is inexpressible and full of glory? Amen. You know, and we see one final positive outcome for trusting Christ here. It says, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your soul. You know, we as believers use this term, saved. You know, are you saved? I was saved on X date. And so I think we do understand the, the salvation that we have now. Um, but it's interesting. You've been using this term over the last couple of weeks or this phrase over the last couple of weeks that I've, that I've really enjoyed. And it's the kingdom of God is already, but not yet. And so I would say the same about salvation, yeah. that our salvation is already, but not yet. You know, and as we, as we really think about this group of believers, as we think about ourselves, um, you know, we, 
we live this life that isn't always perfect. There aren't always these things that we can, you know, be excited about. But especially with this group, I mean, you know, when you were talking last week about, you know, being stuck on a stick and being lit on fire. Um, covered in tar. Covered in tar, yeah. And, and the things that they're going through, being families torn apart and all these things because of their faith in Christ. I have to believe that this group of Christians was longing for Christ's return. I would even venture to say they were prepared for Christ's return as we should be today. And you and Joe were talking last week about being prepared for Christ's return. And you said something that I wrote down and underlined, but it's Take trust. Note of that. People do that. So. <laughs> I figured I would just let him know that I do that while I have this opportunity in front of everybody. I think we, I think we agreed on $10, right? Okay. It's 10 <laughs> Now that we're up here. <laughs> um, you know, but you said, trust your soul to a faithful creator. You know, and, and I wanted to share the last verse that you guys uh, talked about last week, and I'll read it from the New Living Translation is where you guys were at last week, and that's in 1 Peter 4.19. It says, so if you are suffering in a manner that pleases God, keep on doing what is right and trust your lives to the God who created you, for he will never fail you. Amen. Amen. And I would ask us today, you know, answer that question. Have you trusted your soul to a faithful creator? Because he will never fail you. Well, and, and, and if you have, then you can know that joy. You know, the joy, joy is yours to be had. You know, because if you're like me, uh, you know, unless there's some long lost relative that I don't know about, um, you know, that earthly inheritance is not something that I can look forward to. But even I know that if there was, it's, it's, a, it's an inheritance that can fade away. But I have this inheritance that is indestructible, undefiled. It's not going to fade away. And I can have joy in that because I have trusted my soul to a faithful creator. And to be clear, all of us who are in Christ, if you put your faith and trust in Jesus, having died on the cross for your sin, then you have that same promise of inheritance as well. It's, it's not exclusive to one of us. It's true for all of us, which is pretty awesome, isn't it? I mean, if some of you did have a wealthy family member that died, more than likely they're not going to be sharing it with all of us, are they? <laughs> <laughs> likely not. You know, and as we continue uh, back in 1 Peter chapter 1 in our study, starting in verse 10, it says, Concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves but you in the things that have now been announced to you through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. I want to drill down on those first couple of words here. This salvation. And even kind of build upon something that uh, Tony has already said. But our salvation is multifaceted. It's spiritual. If you are in Christ, you have been delivered from the bondage of sin. And the result of sin, which we know to be death. death right? So it's very much spiritual. But it's also spiritual in the sense that it restores you in relationship to the Spirit of God. To the very living creator of all that there is. You are restored through salvation to a living God. That's pretty amazing That's stuff. Awesome. But it's not just spiritual. It's also physical. Because it delivers us, this salvation delivers us from disease and death. Now some of you are thinking, well, I mean, I'm still getting sick. Or, you know, some friend of mine just died. Well, that's the already but not, not yet. yet part okay, of salvation. That we are headed to a place where we will know nothing of disease and death. Are you ready for that place? Yes. And in addition to that, what we're going to see is we're going to be restored, and I've talked about this before, to this superhuman immortality that God has intended for us since creation. That was God's original plan. Go back and read the book. It's in Genesis. But God created us to be these superhuman immortals. We were the ones that goofed that up. 
We were the ones that decided we want to do things our way rather than God's way. And that's why we've been stuck in this place for these last several thousands of years. But this great hope that we have, this salvation, is that it's all going to fit, get fixed. The spiritual elements, the physical elements. And there again is the place where the congregation says, Amen. Amen. Guys, you should be joyous about that. If you were not joyous about that, please excuse me and Tony for not having explained it better, okay? Because honestly, it is something that we should have exceeding joy about. It should permeate everything else that's going on. I realize that some of you are going through some tough stuff right now. Some good friends of ours are actually on a plane as we speak, headed to you know, some others that are looking at a loved one who will probably die here very shortly. I recognize that stuff is all around us. It may be a part of your life. But yet, even in the midst of that, we have this understanding of our salvation. That's the prize. And that's what our eyes need to be focused on. I love here in this passage that we see that the prophets were enthusiastic. In fact, it says that they diligently searched. They inquired. They wanted to know, who is this? When is this going to happen? These were the prophets. I actually love how, how Peter validates even the prophets here, you know, and, and talking about the spirit of Christ that is in them indicated this to them. It's just a really cool uh, piece that I, I just love that Peter puts that in there to help us validate what these guys were saying. Yeah, it, it actually is part of our understanding of the inspiration of Scripture. This wasn't just men who wrote this down, but men who heard from God wrote this down, what God had told them. But the ancient prophets who wrote all this stuff down, they were told that that wasn't for them, that it was for a future people. Again, I, I love how the message sometimes translates stuff in a, in a more vibrant way. This is verse 12. It says, all they were told was that they were serving you. You who by orders from heaven have now heard for yourselves through the Holy Spirit the message of those prophecies fulfilled. Do you realize how fortunate you are? Angels would have given anything to be in on this. Wow. Wow, even the angels in heaven are in awe. Wow, God, you're going to do that for them? Now, of course, Peter's writing to the people who were reading this in the first century, but was he talking just to them? No. No, he was talking to you. This is for you. This is for me. This is what God wants you to take home today. Because some of you aren't quite yet, yet there. In fact, I look at this statement here, and, and I see how enthusiastic the prophets were about salvation. And it takes me back to Daniel and the study we've been doing there. And you might recall that Daniel, when he was there in Babylon, he was in charge of what group of people? Help me. The... Uh, enchanters and magi. Yeah, the magi, the wise men. Wise men, that's the word I was looking for. we see in our New Testament right at the birth, or at least shortly thereafter, of our Savior. In fact, Matthew 2 records this. He says, when they, the magi, saw the star, look at what it says. They rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. Now recognize, these aren't the same magi that Daniel had spoke to, because I believe Daniel was the one who informed the Magi. For, for generations of these wise men, it was passed down from one generation to the next. There's a Messiah coming. There's a Deliverer coming. There's a salvation coming for people that's going to knock your socks off. And they came probably from over a thousand miles away because they saw this star. Oh, that's incredible. And they wanted to be there. And it says they went into the house and they saw the child with Mary, his mother. Do you see what the Magi did? These aren't Jewish believers, mind you. These are Gentile believers. 
from a foreign land who have come. And what do they do? They fall down and worship him. I wonder how many of us see falling down in worship as a part of the Christmas celebration. Wow. Because it really is something worthy of that, is it not? As it was for them, so is it for us. How many of us see that as a way to express joy, falling down and worshiping? Absolutely. It's a beautiful thing of joy. You know, as one of these preachers who've been entrusted with announcing the good news, I believe that many of us don't realize how fortunate we are. Hmm. Maybe that's you today. Maybe as we've read through some of this, you said, well, yeah, that's all good for someone else, but I don't know how that really fits for me. Even some of the rest of us who've been in the faith for a while, I think many of us forget how fortunate we are. Reminds me of a story of a a little boy during the Depression who uh, found out that the circus was coming to town. So he went to his dad and said, Dad, Dad, I want, I want to go to the circus. He had never been to a circus. Imagine what that would be like for a little boy who's never seen what most of us have seen, a circus. Dad tells him there's no way they can afford as a family for him to go. So he begs and begs upon his dad, and his dad says, Well, if you could earn some of the money, I think I can get you at least a ticket. Well, sure enough, the little boy saves and earns that ticket and finds out the day of the circus that they've arrived into town. So he grabs his ticket from his dad and he goes into the city and he's standing on the curb and he's watching as the elephants go by and all the the big cages of the other animals and all the performers are coming by. And a clown comes over to him dancing and so the little boy just hands him his ticket and the clown takes his ticket. He watches as the rest of the circus passes by, and then he goes home. And he says, Dad, Dad, I went to the circus. And his dad said, wow, son, why why are you back so soon? He said, well, I went. He says, well, well, tell me what you saw. And he told him what he saw and how the clown came and took his ticket. And he says, my son, you simply saw the parade. You missed the main event. Hmm. Is that you, Christian? Have you, at some point in the distance past, responded to an invitation, put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, and then gave some clown your ticket and just went back home? Because God has so much more for you than that. God wants you to be ready for the main event, and the main event is coming to a city near you. And it is the coming kingdom of Jesus Christ on this earth. And what we've been trying to say for this entire study is that why Jesus was born is so incredibly important. Do not let the skeptics of this world dismiss that. Don't let them steal your joy. I'll confess to you something. Of the studies that we're doing on Advent, this for me is my hardest. I get the hope piece. I get the preparation piece, even the week following this is going to be love. I get all that, but I struggle the most with joy. And to quote an old country western song, or to paraphrase it, I guess I should say, some of you will recognize this, I look for joy in all the wrong places. I suspect I'm like some of you. I find joy in relationships. I certainly have a tremendously joyous relationship with my wife, very precious to me almost always gives me joy. I have relationships with my children that often give me joy. (laughs) Not always. Same is true with friends. I find joy in my work often, but sometimes not always, right? But I'm looking in all the wrong places. Is that you today? Because if that's you today, then I want you to join with me and say, I'm going to stop looking in those places. I'm going to start looking in the only place that true joy can be found. And that's in the person of Jesus Christ. Amen. Mm. Amen. I'm glad he was born. How about you? Absolutely. Would you stand? Let's close in prayer. Father God, we do 
come to you in prayer today, Lord, expressing joy. Lord, I pray that that joy would be inexpressible and full of glory. Lord, we do so many times look for joy in the wrong places. And I pray that today, Lord, would be that day that we look to you for that joy, that we look to that coming kingdom. We look to that, uh, that salvation that we have already, but it's not quite yet fully revealed. Lord, that brings us joy to think about what you have in store for us, Lord, an inheritance that is incorruptible, undefiled, and it doesn't fade away. And it is kept by you, God, and that brings us joy. We're so thankful for that. Lord, as we, as we go out from this pray, place, Lord, I, I do pray that that joy would be revealed to others, that they would see that in us, Lord, so that many more would come to you. We thank you, God, for who you are today. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for listening in. If you have any questions about New Life Living, you can call us at area code 505-898-9788 or email us at info at nlnm.org. Until next time, our prayer and hope is you will experience the fullness of the new life Jesus has to offer you.